we will be good to go. All right, well, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and today we have some subject matter experts as well as all the rest of you, you know, who are, are willing to join this forum and, and contribute to the conversation and, and say, yeah, ask me anything, let's, let's, um, let's get down on this and let's figure out what we're gonna do in this, this crazy new world order, you know, if you will. Um, our session today lasts for, you know, close to an hour, anywhere between a half an hour and, and um, 45 minutes to an hour. And basically, you are, this is your forum. This is not a, a Q&A where, you know, where Lisa sits there and says, yeah, go ahead, and ask me. Okay, next question. Next, next. No, this is, is supposed to be a conversation. So let's talk about it. Let's uh, find out what's on your thought, on your minds. What kinds of things are you worrying about? If you're saying to yourself, like some people are, you know, what, what career, you know, what's happened to my career? What do I do now, you know, in, in this crazy world? Um, but so feel free at any point to, to pipe up and ask a question or make a comment or share some insight that you have or, or something from your experience or the experience of your colleagues. If there is something that you would like to ask, um, but you don't wanna maybe say it out publicly, just put it in the chat and I'd be happy to serve it up for you. So let me tell you a little bit about Lisa. We are supposed to have another subject matter expert join us. I think she's having technical trouble. So we're gonna start off with Lisa, which puts a lot of pressure on her, right? So we're gonna start out with Lisa. There she is, Wonder Woman. She has no worries. And then um, if Annalia- I'm inspired by Wendy. <laughs> there you go. If Annalia is able to join us, then I will introduce, introduce you to her as well. But, First of all, Lisa is the founder and the managing director of Spotlight Recruiting, where she helps growing organizations find the diverse talent they need to successfully scale. And where other recruiting companies might shy away from a difficult candidate search, Lisa really enjoys the hunt for that hard to fill role, making Spotlight Recruiting the go-to firm for diverse leadership talent. And I think that, that what makes Lisa so qualified to help lead us in today's Ask Me Anything is that creative and diverse approach toward career counseling, toward recruiting, toward um, you know, making a match between a need and a candidate. So I think that that's really something that's going to be super helpful in this very, very fluid landscape. And Lisa, I'd like to say that when I was a hiring manager, I wonder where the hell you were because I could have really used you. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, no, absolutely. So thank you for the great introduction. I'm excited to be here. I think it's a truly important topic. And I think for many, if you have been, um, whatever the case may be, you're, you're currently employed and you're just trying to maintain, or you're currently employed, but they're, you're being redeployed to a different area of the business, mm -hmm. um, or you've been furloughed, or, you know, unfortunately, if you've been laid off, I mean, yeah. there's just, everyone's going through something, um, and so I think it's an important topic. Yeah, definitely. So um, let's just go ahead and, and kick off the conversation with, um, acknowledging that maybe things have changed you know for for some of us in our in our workplaces um it does anyone want to share maybe what the world looks like for you and how it's different from two months ago is versus what it is right now i can share um because we've been uh, very actively um, providing services throughout this time but obviously doing it a little differently. Um, I work for an organization that provides uh, like living support services to adults with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we have continued to be um, providing services throughout the whole COVID-19, but we've also, I'm just going to bring it into what we're talking about today. If we've had to continue to recruit knowing that employees would be going out in self-isolation, that they could even um, become ill and test positive and be out as well and also our clients you know might um, become ill so 
one of the things that has been um, different is finding ways to continue to recruit um, and bring on onboard people when we're trying to limit the amount of contact, um, but then also dealing with people's um, perceptions and their own fears around the whole situation, which has been a little bit challenging as well. Um, when we first were in the process of dealing with COVID-19, we actually, I actually had staff that were saying, we shouldn't be recruiting anymore. Why are we recruiting? We shouldn't be doing that and having to deal with that as well. Um, and I do think going forward, um, I am curious to hear what people think in regards to the um, recruiting and onboarding, how much of what we are now utilizing do we think we will continue to utilize and what parts will we, um, or I guess be required to continue to do in person, like the verification of social security cards and um, driver's license card certificates. Like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, in terms of like what how how quickly has the industry maybe shifted um, some of those requirements or changed some of those requirements? I have a, a good friend who works for the contingent workforce for LinkedIn, and uh, they were she's working ten to twelve hour days because they are so backlogged with waiting for verifications to come through, and meantime trying to, to find people who have been approved sooner that maybe they got approved for a different role, but they're really desperately needed over here. And that role is still waiting for all the ver verification to go on. So is there anything changing there? Any, uh, I mean, I know that's not an area you can really let up on, right? Well, I, I will tell you for ours, um, we were fortunate because the, um, the Department of Developmental Services worked very closely with um, the state licensing and um, they were able to get some exemptions in the sense that they were able to waive certain requirements um, before you actually hire people. Mm -hmm. uh, but they still said you can bring them on and start training, but they still need to do that while you're waiting for the actual official um, you know, background clearance or um, those type of things, you could still have them come on and work. And the exemptions were primarily made if those individuals also had been or are currently working with other nonprofit organizations like ourselves, which mm -hmm. would have been required to go through the background screening and all of those type of screenings prior. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's probably going to be, you know, a question on how long are they going to allow those exemptions to go and um, are they going to go back to requiring those things that you have them in hand prior to allowing them to come on and start training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the um, 10, 9, the, uh, is it the I-9, sorry, getting my numbers. <laughs> um, but the I-9 is, uh, that's like the one form that I had a lot of my staff in um, the HR and um, management trying to figure out how to do that because of the fact that it required you visually seeing it. And um, I actually, and Lisa, you probably know that know this or not, I don't, but I'm assuming that they did not waive that. I think they still required you to see items in person before yeah, not to my knowledge that has not been changed so hmm. yeah so that that could be um, that could be a real snag in the way that that we do business moving forward I mean I can understand some of that verification being um, critical but um, I don't know I don't know yeah, I think um, one of the, the, if people were to kind of look at the lessons learned through all of this is for me being in the field that I'm in, knowing a lot of our employees work for multiple organizations serving the same population. We as an organization are required to do the background, even if I know that they're working at another organization and I've already done that background and have cleared it. Um, I, I think moving forward for you know, purposes of um, making things easier and more fluid when an emergency situation like this comes up, it would be wise for 
the state, um, whether it's the Department of Developmental Services or the licensing, that, that instead of requiring us to send them individually, that they could actually have a, you know, a registration portal or something that you would just go there to verify that they they met those requirements and not having to pay for those and having them go out and do them, mm -hmm. even though they've already passed it over here. I mean, that would make things a little bit easier um, in our case, particularly because they all kind of work in the same system generally. That's a great idea. Kind of something like the TSA pre-check where you know you jump through all those hurdles and and stuff but you do it once and then and it's only good for a certain period of time you know so i i it would probably have to be a shorter window than than what the pre-check is but um something like i mean i i just honestly feel like i i said before we started the meeting that that the world of work has changed you know things are going to look different after this it's a, a great proving field for the processes we have in place, do they work? Do they stand, you know, through the test of a, um, an emergency, you know, like this? And what do we do to make that better in the future? Jill, what, what do you do? Sure, so I work at Cal State San Marcos and I work in the College of Business under um, the umbrella of student success. So working, but specifically for career and professional development. Great. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And has, what are you doing? Are, everything is remote, I'm assuming. Yeah, right? everything is remote. Um, I think there are very few people on campus right now, such as IT folks and um, just anyone who's critical to being there. Everybody else is at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it's been, you know, I think it's been overall a good opportunity for me because I think it's been a catalyst for thinking outside of the box and thinking about where we're behind and how we need to now pivot. Yeah. So um, I'm really enjoying now thinking about integrating more technology because I, we over, I oversee a program called Business Professional Development, which is a class. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our curriculum currently is more of like practical face-to-face let's practice that handshake, which who knows where that's going to go now. Right. Um, and let's get in front of employers face to face and talk and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, what I, I'm enjoying is a lot of my colleagues are thinking outside of the box in ways that they can network with employers, a lot of Zoom webinars, um, mm -hmm. other technology that they're exploring for uh, working with the classes. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's kind of um, exhilarating, I guess, just to be able to create and innovate at this time. Right. Um, but I'm just, I just happen to be in a field where that is something that makes sense, right? And I don't, you know, I feel for the people who are working in labs, right, that actually have to still go in and process samples and things like that. Yeah. Wow. So Lisa, what what are you hearing from your clients from the companies that you work with in terms of their future hiring or um, or the way that they might be changing the way they look at at workforce development and workforce um, additions and subtractions what's it looking like on your end well for the clients that i'm working with um, some of them have put some of their positions on hold uh, there are some who are still hiring like their interns for the summer Mm -hmm. um, and they're also looking at their staff and trying to, um, for example, if they've, they've got a staff of recruiters and they've got a hiring freeze, um, they're looking at those recruiters and saying, okay, um, where can we redeploy you in the business? Um, what skill sets do you have and strengths that can help us somewhere else okay. versus having to lay them off or furlough them? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know, is kind of the same across a lot of organizations is they are maybe not getting quite ready to hire yet. And then for those firms that maybe are not hiring, but know they will be, that things are going to pick up, um, it's starting to kind of pipeline and saying, okay, when things turn, we want to have those applicants ready to bring them on board. So mm -hmm. it's um, a little bit different, I guess, in terms of it's more engagement of that candidate to 
make sure that when they're ready, you can move them aboard. So it's kind of like pipelining for your position. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I like what you said that, that they're looking instead of furloughing or laying off, that is there somewhere else that they could be deployed in the business? Because, you know, if you think about um, one of the big major complaints in, in American business today is that it, it seems like the rally cry is do more with less. So there's always more work that needs to be done and not enough people to do it. You know, so what, a, what an amazing opportunity possibly to, to look for different ways to distribute the work. And, and I know that's hard in organizations because of the way their hierarchy and so forth is set up, but you know, what a time for challenging the status quo and for you know, looking for different ways you know, to do business. Right, right. Yeah. And I think for, I mean, um, one of the, I think the challenges is uh, if you're a manager and you have a really stellar employee, um, you kind of want to keep them to yourself. You don't want to let them go. Mm -hmm. um, and the fear is that I let them go. What if they never come back? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it's a good strategy because uh, you're investing in your, your employees. Yeah. Um, and it's also good just for your brand. Um, yes. People will want to work in an organization where they truly um, are trying to take care of their employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and unfortunately, I mean, sometimes it's not the case that they, they care about the employees. But sometimes you do need to furl and sometimes you need to lay off. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, uh, you know, I've been in that situation. I've, I've felt that I had a job that I loved and unfortunately was part of reduction in force. Um, but that led me to human resources, which I loved even more. And now I've been doing it, you know, for over 15 years. Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess there's, when a door closes, a window opens. Is that the saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So what are you doing, um, Lisa, with, um, in, in terms of managing maybe your own career development or your, how are you getting creative about your, um, what's, how am I trying to say, like your prospects and so forth? Are you looking at ways to add a different stream of income or a different service that you offer or? Um, yeah, so it's, it's um, funny that you asked this question because one of the things that I've always done as far as, you know, my focus is on the organization and bringing the talent in, um, not so much as um, the career development of individuals. However, I do end up helping a lot of people because they find out that I am a recruiter and they will, do you think you could maybe help me look at my resume, give me some tips, that sort of thing. And so I find myself doing that quite often, um, which I've always done just out of this joy of doing it. And so part of me is like, well, maybe I need to come up with something that is a little bit more um, formal uh, mm -hmm. that I can share with people who are, you know, trying to find um, a position and just some of the tips and tricks and things and what I look for in a resume and, you know, the firms that I work for and other recruiters um, just to give them perspective. Mm -hmm. Great, great. How about any of you that are on the call? Is there something unique or different that you're doing right now in terms of the way you normally did business or the, the way that you normally conducted your, yourself as a professional and you've, you've started doing something differently? I don't know that I've done something differently, but I'm doing more of things that I didn't do as much before, I guess, because of the whole um, needing to be more virtual. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually learned a lot about Zoom. I can change my background, although, you know, we've already discussed my background. Um, so if I'm at home, I probably change it to this so I can keep people on their toes. They never know where I am. But the other is, is um, I think some of the things that I've been doing is spending a little bit more time um, on some of the, uh, like LinkedIn and Twitter, more so to keep updated, but also to kind of see what other people are doing. Um, and I've been fascinated um, about like some of how quickly some organizations really jumped into this whole virtual way of doing business. And um, so in regards to like recruiting, I saw they're having a lot of 
virtual job fairs. And I was like, that's actually really cool. And it's even more, um, I guess, uh, impactful to me because of the nature of the services I do. And that would be something that a lot of individuals with disabilities could participate in very easily um, versus having to figure out how to get someplace, you know, whether it's them um, having to use transfer, local transportation or getting a ride. But then also, um, I haven't done one. I don't know, Lisa, have you ever been in a virtual job fair? Because um, I saw it, but I just didn't have the time to to go on and I just was curious how that works. Like, how do you do a virtual job fair as an individual? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I don't know if I've necessarily done a whole virtual job fair before. Um, I have done pieces of a virtual job fair where we did some pre-screening, kind of the invitation ahead of time of an event. Um, but I think that, you know, with Zoom and being able to do out into breakout rooms and everything else, I mean, the recruiting that I do right now is all virtual. Mm -hmm. um, I don't go on site to the organization, um, but I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think, you know, investing in technology, that is going to be the wave of the future. And uh, I think as long as, you know, it's, if it's done correctly, yeah, I think it's, it's a great thing. Um, there's a lot of, I've been attending a lot of virtual conferences, yeah. which I would say are probably very similar um, mm -hmm. because, you know, you get information and then you break out into groups. And um, so, yeah. I think that the um, companies that embraced technology um, as a value add earlier were better positioned for this, you know, and, and I think about, um, arguments that I had years ago. I, you know, I managed software engineers, software developers, and so forth. And, and it was very common for me to send them home to work if we were on a tight deadline, because they got a lot more done at home. But that was in the early 2000s. And I had to fight my company for that privilege for them, because they were still very much in the well, how do you manage them? How do you make sure they're not goofing off? How do you, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's become more and more uh, acceptable, I guess, but still more maybe in the tech companies than in some of the other industries. And then bam, something like this happens. And if you weren't ready for it, if you didn't have any kind of, um, any kind of platform for that or, then you were sort of left in the cold. We, Michelle, um, the CEO of, of CWI and I were talking about this because we started doing these virtual forums last year. We started in May of last year and it was slow going, you know, kind of ramping them up and getting people accustomed to, to doing something like that. But when this happened, man, we were, we were good to go. You know, we could start spinning them out, you know, two or three a week trying to get information out to people that they needed in a timely manner. And some of the other associations that we saw were still trying to figure out like, well, do we use GoToMeeting? Do we use Zoom? Do we this, do we that, you know? And so I think that we were ahead of the game with that. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Lisa, virtual conferences. Um, I belong to Project Management Institute. And for the, um, the global, it's a, it's a global association they started doing their global conference virtually probably three years ago. And you register for it, you register for the classes that you wanna be in, and then there you are with a, an instructor teaching something, and you're with people from all over the world, you know, which is just really, um, really fascinating. You know, but the, like I said, they've been doing it for a very long time. So um, I'm going to attend one tomorrow that's the Women Transforming Technology, which is a Bay Area conference. And where the whole thing is online now, the whole thing is virtual. And what they were saying that is so exciting is that there are women who have registered now for this from all over the globe instead of it being, um, you know, so so localized. And and I um, in one of our coffee meetings, uh, one of the CWI members said, "Man, I went overnight from being a regional." coach and speaker and and um consultant to i'm now national and it was you know just because once you were there once you were available you know people were able to 
to hire you. So I, I just think this is a fascinating time, you know, to see how it's, how it's going to change. So who else has something to contribute here? What, how has your world changed? What kinds of, what kinds of things are on your mind about changing that we can ask our, our resident smarty pants Lisa here about? <laughs> I have a question, Lisa. Um, you deal mostly with, I'm assuming, a lot of corporate level entries or that kind of a corporate jobs, correct? M would you say most of it? Yeah. So how do you, is. okay, so do you get, cre do you have uh, clients where you have to be a little more creative where they are doing something that's totally not corporate? They have over 30 years of experience, but they don't have a degree. How do you, how do you, advice to uh, put on paper all the talent and experience without the degree? Mm. Well, I think, you know, as far as when you're looking at your resume, um, it, I mean, if the job itself requires a degree, that's something different because if they've said, hey, that's a quali qualification you need to have, um, but if the positions don't require a degree, the experience that you have, that's what's going to sell you. And the big thing that I try to instill in anybody who they ask for my advice on what they should be putting either, you know, on their resume, their LinkedIn, or even in just their conversation is you need to have achievement statements. You need to tell the person that you're speaking with or whoever's looking at your resume that um, this is why, not just this is what I did, but this is what I did, here's the action I took, and here was the result. Um, if you can, you know, you want to think in terms of, um, you know, did you win awards? Um, did you finish projects on time, under budget? Um, uh, you know, what were the metrics? Use numbers, dollars, percentages. All of those things are going to make you stand out. Um, of the rest of the crowd. Um, one of the things that makes it easy is look at your performance reviews. If you have past performance reviews, those are always giving like, hey, these are the awesome things that you did that year. So it's kind of a great place to start. Um, or just start thinking back of like situations or projects that you had and then identifying, okay, what was the problem? What was the challenge? What were we trying to do? What was my involvement? And then what was the result? Did I, how did I help the company? How did I help the customer? How did I help my client? How did I help employees? Um, and if you can come up with that, then it makes those kind of bulleted statements are gonna be a lot easier. Plus it's gonna help you even when you're in that interview process or you know, just having the conversation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Can, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, my next question in regards to that is, let's say, and I've, I have no experience with recruiters and my family neither, so um, this is a really like maybe a stupid question. When you uh, ha ask for a recruiter's help, is it a, is it a, is it a one or other where the person looking for a job pays a recruiter or does a recruiter get paid by the corporation they get hired? How does it work? Or is there two different plans, like a plan A and plan B? So I guess if you're, um looking for, so I guess there's two couple of things. So if you go to say a, a search firm or a staffing firm or a temporary service, um, they are not going to charge you. You should never pay them. Um, they get paid when they place you on a job, okay? Um, but they will help you because it's in their benefit to get you placed on a position. Um, now, if you are um, working with like a career advisor or recruiter who is um, just trying to help you, say, work on your resume um, and, you know, do mock interviews, they may in turn charge you. Um, but if you're working with some, like, say, a staffing firm or um, outplacement firm or you know, any of those type of firms, they should not be charging you for their time. But like a career counselor, career advisor, um, okay. they will charge you by the, probably by the hour. Sometimes it's by the resume. Um, okay. it, it just depends. Everybody's got a little bit different. So, so you as a recruiter 
only do help with resumes and help with interview process? You don't actually find the jobs for the client? So what I do, um, so for my firm, and so my firm would be a little bit different. So you think almost like an in-house recruiter, someone who works for the corporation. Their oh, focus is um, going out and finding talent to bring into the organization. Um, and that's what I do. Um, but some firms, so if I worked for like a headhunting firm, um, then if I work for a headhunting firm, I am helping the organization find talent, but I am also going out and finding the talent in advance. So I would have a focus or a niche. So let's say it's marketing. I, I focus on marketing executives. I would go out and find marketing executives who I could place with my clients, and then I would work with them. Um, a good one in, um, I guess a good example is um, there's when my husband was transitioning out of the military, um, he worked with a recruitment headhunting firm that actually worked with him to work on his resume, how he would present himself to business organizations because he was trans transitioning from, you know, a military environment into a corporate environment. Mm -hmm. um, he did not pay for that um, because they typically a headhunting firm or uh, retained or, you know, search firm, they're going to get upwards of 30% of salary um, in payment when they place you on a job. Mm -hmm. uh, to understand what you do, you have your, you have your own company. Is that what you do, Lisa? I do. Correct. And so your client is not like, like, let's say me, your client would be a corporation where you're looking for the talent. So do you, is your place, do you go on LinkedIn to find a lot of your, uh, I do. Okay. And, yeah, and so you, I would say nearly, you know, I don't, I don't have, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to give a generalization. I don't have a hard and fast number, but I would say 90% of recruiters utilize LinkedIn to, as one of their resources to find talent. Yeah. That was a great so, question, Monique, because it's, um, oh, yeah. it's, it's how, you know, if, if Lisa has a, a, a client to satisfy, you know, who has a number of requirements, what are some of the things that she's going to be using to look out and find that talent to satisfy their, their needs and so forth. So again, it takes us right back to how important it is to have um, an online presence somewhere that, that is accessible, you know, by a recruiter who's looking, you have no idea who's looking for you. <laughs> right, right. And that's, you know, one of the things that I tell people is, you know, LinkedIn's a great resource and you should, um, it's very, you know, have a LinkedIn and a resume um, and your LinkedIn profile is going to help you not, you know, you're going to be applying for positions because LinkedIn has like, you know, a lot of positions that you can look at and they have um, a lot of the job boards will have this where you can sign up to get alerts when jobs are actually posted. Um, so as soon as they're posted, you can apply. Uh, and LinkedIn uses an easy apply. Most of most job boards are gonna have some sort of an easy apply. Um, but it basically takes your profile and you hit submit and your profile goes to the recruiter. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side of it, recruiters like myself will go and look for individuals and review their profiles and reach out if I feel they could be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that's kind of cool on LinkedIn um, is if you do have your entire profile updated and with all your skills and things like that, when a job gets posted, they will tell you the percentage of your compatibility between your skills and experience with what the position's asking for. And it will also tell you where you rank and who else on LinkedIn has applied for that position. So it, I would I was gonna say if if you are looking for uh, employment, um, I would highly encourage you to spend time on your LinkedIn profile, making sure it's up to date and um, and put that you are interested in jobs uh, because I myself have been reached out multiple times by recruiters, and I don't even have that I'm looking. And um, I've also had opportunities come my way for um, people looking for board positions um, and people to sit on their board. But I, I would say LinkedIn's a great tool, great tool if you are looking for um, a job. And you know, the more you're on it and the more you're active, um, you get seen by more people. 
Yeah. So, um, Lisa, I have a, another qu a, a baby question, and then and then um, I'll, I'll I'll wait till other people have a chance, and then I'll ask my bigger question. So, the baby question is: Let's say I'm looking for interns. You mentioned you work you have you work with interns. Um, do you work specifically on the corporate level only, or do you have like are your are your boundaries bigger, or do you like to focus on just that kind of so the type of talent that I go after is um, typically is senior leadership roles. So I do executive roles um, or they're hard to fill. So the organizations that I have that let's say they're doing interns, um, more, it's more so I put a kind of a strategy together for them to say here is you know, a strategy that I would follow to identify um, your interns versus doing the, the actual tactical recruiting for them. Is that, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Um, it, uh, it was, it got cut out because my internet is uh, shaky here. So I think I got the gist of it. Um, okay. And I'll, I'll wait to ask my other bigger question after give other people a chance as I'm hogging all the questions here. <laughs> oh, you're fine, good. So what, what else are, are y'all interested in, in asking Lisa about? Maybe what, what's a good use of our time right now if, you, if you're finding that you don't have as much work as you normally would? Um, what would be a good way to fill in some of that extra time or to get creative about improving your, your prospects? Well, I think um, it, whether, I mean, this is going to kind of be the same across the board, whether you're, you know, currently employed um, or you're being redeployed or whatever, the, you know, or you've been laid off or furloughed, it's, um, you know, it's not the time to kind of let off the gas. Um, you mm. want to, it, you know, if you are currently employed with the organization, um, you want to continue to shine and you want to be, you know, that hand raiser. Um, to say, hey, I'm here um, to work on the priorities of the organization, and I want to help the organization get to where we need to go. Um, and I think, you know, maybe this is also a time to say, hey, look at, you know, are there projects that you wanted to work on, whether you're currently working or you're not? Um, there's a lot of um, upskill or reskill or learn a new skill. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, Courses like you have um, Coursera, Linda, um, I'm not naming them all. I can't think of all of them, but mm -hmm. those are the ones that come right you to me. Those are the ones that come to mind. Right. That they have a lot of courses right now that are fairly inexpensive um, that you can get certification in. Um, and I think as you know, Wendy has said and Patty as well, is there's a lot of conferences right now. I mean, I am inundated on a daily basis with webinars. Um, and just things that are out there just for information, just to continue um, building your skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's something that, you know, you definitely can do. Um, and um, as far as the social aspect um, is, you know, stay social on, you know, your social platforms in a professional level. Um, something that, you know, maybe it's a book you wanted to read. Um, so you just read this book. So that would be a great thing to, you know, utilize to say, you know, if it's part of, um, you know, for me, if it was something in talent management, you know, I might want to, you know, put something out about that. Mm. Um, so I think it's just, you know, a way networking is going to be a big thing. Um, and, and the one thing I would say for a lot of people is you should always be nurturing your relationships. Um, because you just never know what is going to happen. And so you don't want to truly wait until, you know, that unfortunate time that now you're looking for a job and now you're kind of um, starting from scratch. Now that happens. So that would be the other thing I would say is, hey, maybe this is a good time for you to start, you know, reaching out to people and, you know, getting those relationships going. Mm -hmm. um, have a virtual coffee because we can't go to coffee. Or, you know, maybe it's a group of people that you get together. I think for me personally, um, I've been talking to a lot of colleagues that are across the country, probably more so, just because it's easier and it seems natural to get on a Zoom call nowadays versus, um, you know, just some of the local where we're going to just, you know, meet for coffee somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, just being actively 
um, connecting with people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great advice, great guidance. Any other thoughts from anyone? You know, what was it Rahm Emanuel said, don't let a, a crisis go to waste, you know, don't waste a disaster or something like that. It's like, how do you, how do you take the best of this time? You know, how do you improve your skills? You know, there's never, never any time to take that Excel class. Well, guess what? Now you just might have the time, you know, to take that. So any other thoughts, Monique, you can, you can go ahead and ask your big hairy question that you were hanging off on. Um, well, it was a, well, there was a few, um, I was going to ask Lisa, if you, uh, deal with just national, do you deal with international job searches? Um, uh, if a recruiter, re that's one question. If a recruiter reaches out on uh, LinkedIn, what are some key things to look for in like a good recruiter? What are things to like be wary of? Um, things like that. Okay. Um, so, um, down to the first part. So for me, so I do national and international, um, and things to look for as far as a recruiter. So they, again, you should never have to pay for a job. Um, and you should not ever have to pay them. So if that happens, it get out. Red flag, yeah. Yeah, that, that's definitely a red flag. Mm -hmm. um, now it would be different, like if it, you know, like I said, if you're dealing with like a career advisor, a career counselor, a coach, then that's different. Um, but to be offered a position, you should never have to pay to go to work. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a definite red flag. And then, as far as um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, if you're working with um, a search firm. Per se, let's say you've gone to a firm and said, hey, I would like your help in finding a position. Um, one of the things I would recommend is to, what is to ask the recruiter to talk to you first before sending your resume to an organization. Um, because sometimes if you give them blanket, like, I just, whatever, just send it out. I didn't care. Um, then they could send it out to a lot of different places. And in the end, you may not be even interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, want to say, let me know what you're, who you're sending it to first. I would like to give the approval for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I think that, that if you're working with a recruiter, um, that you need to realize that you, uh, you have a huge part of this, obviously, you know, because when the, when the placement is done, when the contract is signed, um, you're the one still in that job, you know, moving forward and stuff. So, you know, kind of having the mindset that that recruiter works for you as much as they're working for the other company. You know, really good recruiters don't want a one and done. They want an ongoing relationship with the companies they're working with. So it's in definitely in their best interest to make a good placement and not put you in front of somebody that you know it's not a good fit. It's not a good fit you know, skills, it's not a good fit culturally, you know, all of that. So yeah, those are, that's good, good guidance, Lisa, just tell them, hey, I want to know where you're submitting me first, you know, as well as, you know, when I, when I was looking to move from San Diego up here to the Bay Area, I worked with a very trusted recruiter. And I told him, do not submit me to these, you know, and I had like three companies that I would not have worked for, don't submit me to them. And, you know, and he followed that. He was great, you know, and, and so forth. But that was kind of me managing my own career as we made, you know, made this transition from one location to another. Yeah, and I would think they'd be appreciative of that um, mm -hmm. because then they're not having to spend their time nurturing, you know, trying to get you into that interview when yeah. in the end that you wouldn't want it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, taking a square peg and shoving it in that round hole. <laughs> yes, it'll work. Yes, it'll work. Not good for anybody. Not good for anybody. Um, Lisa, if if you've gone through the whole process, you did your, you know, you you inquired about what company's looking, and and you get the resume and you turn it in, and then they do, you know, one interview phone call, one interview Zoom call, and it's now okay. Let's do an interview in person. You know that whole process. Is it um, is it cool to or uh, like? the norm to ask let's say they have if you don't live in the state they pay for the flight wherever it is the company um it depends 
so some of the organizations that I work for specifically in San Diego, I get this a lot, is they we will search outside of California and the San Diego area, but they do not offer relocation benefits. Um, and so um, right up front, we tell people that, hey, we don't offer relocation. So this is something that you will need to be able to have the ability to move here on your own. Um, as far as having you fly out for interviews, that's really up to the company um, and their budget if it's something they want to do. So the organization that I've, one of the organizations I've worked for that doesn't offer relocation, um, everything we do is on Zoom. We do Zoom calls um, and uh, the interviews are on Zoom. And then the final interview is in person. Um, and again, it just depends on budget. Sometimes their budget will allow them to fly someone out and sometimes their budget won't. Um, and if it's the case that they can't fly someone out, <clears throat> then sometimes the candidate is like, hey, I'm gonna be out there anyway, because typically, because they're not offering relocation, they have another reason that they are gonna be in San Diego. So they're like, hey, I'm gonna come see my family, I'm gonna come see friends, and we just work around what their schedule would be. Mm -hmm. but but it's okay to ask yeah you can ask it yeah absolutely I don't think there's anything wrong with that mm -hmm. yeah I was uh, I interviewed with one company up here in the Bay Area I was still living in San Diego and we had done um, a couple of phone interviews not not zoom they were just telephone interviews and then they flew me up here for a face-to-face -face interview and it was pretty grueling it was like all day long um but it, the funny thing is is that the when i first got there um first i met with the the hr person and then i met with the hiring manager then i started meeting with teams of people and so forth and i had just met with the hiring manager and had already decided this isn't going to be good for me this is not a good I don't like this place. I don't like this person. You know, it was just like pretty clear to me that this there's kind of no point in going on. But I went through the whole day just because they had gone to the expense of flying me up there and so forth. And and then at the end of the day, I said I, um, you know, thanked them for their time and all that stuff, and said I had a lot to think about and all of that. You know, but it kind of struck me coming home what a what a huge. Um, expense that was for them and it wasn't they i'm sure i was not um the only person they were doing that for you know so if we had been able to do some of that via zoom i would have much preferred it you know and i'm sure it would have been nice for them as well so hey lisa we have a question in the chat um it says any advice on how to prep for an interview yes i do <laughs> um so most of your interviews now are going to be on zoom um, so I think, you know, you, there was, um, and Patty, you can talk to this. I think you, you um, and I apologize. I cannot remember um, her name, but she did uh, ask me anything about how to look on camera and video. Yeah. Um, and it was, I don't know. And it, I, I know that it's available to watch. So I would yeah, say watch it was, it was Londi, Londi Maduro. Yeah, Londi, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say watch that. Yeah. Um, and then as far as preparing for it. So. Um, one thing is you want to research the organization. Um, you should have an understanding of what they do and what problems they're trying to solve. Um, if you can, try and research the person you're going to be interviewing with, mm -hmm. um, if that's available. Um, and then the other is read what the job advertisement or job description is and anticipate the questions that they're going to be asking you. So what are the qualifications that they are looking for? Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is um, come up with, for each of the roles that you've been in, you know, I would say three to five or, you know, at a minimum three um, situations um, that, and this is for each of your, your jobs, like for the past, you know, the most recent jobs that you've had, so the last couple jobs. Um, a problem, um, a challenge, what action you took, what result from that. Um, because anything, you know, um, if you've had a problem or you've dealt with a project or situation, there's always all kinds of things 
um, as far as soft skills that go into that, whether it's project management, it's creativity, it's innovation, it's, you know, working with a budget. Um, so if you can think of those stories, um, that's going to help you and practice them. That's mm -hmm. going to help you. And you don't want to come across rehearsed, but you also want, um, you know, you get nervous and sure. people get nervous and they forget and then they tend to ramble and talk a lot. Um, so you just kind of want to just put some forethought into it. Yes. Um, and I think of thinking of those questions in advance, kind of anticipating them, it's going to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, winging a job interview is never a good thing to do. <laughs> but it's amazing how many people do that, right? It, it is. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, kind of just develop a situation specific kind of story. Mm -hmm. um, and again, um, two, you know, two to three stories per job. Um, and because that's the other thing is, is, is you know, you want to, for as a, you know, a recruiter, when I'm assessing someone, I want to see how deep they can go. Um, and if they keep relying on the same situation, then my question is, okay, so what, I know you did other things in the organization. Tell me about some of the other things you did. Yeah. Um, and the stories are good versus kind of that academic answer, which that's another thing a lot of people give is um, the academic answer, which is, this is, you know, this is what I think you want to hear. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you that versus kind of going, this is what I did. This was, here's my story. And here's, you know, the results that I was able to get. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's and good. then I would say dress for the interview too. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I hate to say this, but I had a client that we had a couple of interviews and one of the candidates, I mean, and it was an executive level job and this is pre-COVID, um, but they did not dress for the interview. And the CEO was like, Gosh, I don't know if they're really that interested. You would have thought that for this level of position. So what I, you know, I would say it is that, you know, kind of think about um, if you were working for that organization and attending a professional event for them, dress that way. Mm -hmm. You're better to be over, you know, overdressed than underdressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, this has been a really great time, ladies. I want to be um, cognizant of your time and, and let you go at the end of our hour here. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us and giving of your time and expertise uh, and being willing to sit in the hot seat and say, yeah, go ahead, ask me anything. <laughs> We won't ask you about cooking or, you know, uh, dog walking or things like that. But Yeah, definitely not my expertise. Yeah. For sure. um, but no, my pleasure. So thank you for asking me to be here. So, yeah. so make sure that y'all keep your LinkedIn profiles up to date. If you are not friends with Lisa already, reach out and connect with her on LinkedIn. Definitely. And uh, until we all meet again, just keep watching the CWI Facebook page, the LinkedIn page watch for our upcoming sessions and stuff because we just keep having more and more things coming up trying to help us all personally and professionally grow not just at this time but you know just in our careers too so thanks again everybody thank you for joining me thanks again lisa and hey, everyone be safe thanks everyone thank you bye